we'll now talk about output optimization and maximization of profit. Profit maximization occurs when the difference between total revenue and total cost is the greatest. This is a fairly intuitive concept. Another strategy is to say that profit maximization occurs when marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. This is what I said on the previous slide and we will talk about why this is the case. And the third way of coming up with your profit maximizing output is to say that the revenue value of the output from the last unit of input employed is equal to the cost of employing that input level. This is going to be covered in the next section, section 3.2 of the curriculum. These are actually three different approaches of coming up with profit maximization and all three approaches will give the same profit maximizing output level. In other words, these three are equivalent. Let's take the first approach, which is fairly straightforward. Again, if we have a dollar figure on the y-axis, quantity of output on the x-axis, what we are saying is that if we start from a small quantity and increase, here we have a simple situation where total revenue is increasing linearly. The total cost obviously has a fixed cost component and goes up first slowly and then very fast. Here clearly we have a loss because the revenue is less than the cost. This is a break-even point. After the break-even point, the total revenue is more than the cost. But you can notice that as we move to the right, as we increase quantity, the profit is increasing. We need to find the point where this distance, the distance between total revenue and total cost is the maximum. Roughly speaking, that would be this point. So our profit maximizing quantity would be over here. After this, we still have profits, but the profit is not maximum. So it would make sense for our quantity produced to be right here. As we keep increasing quantity, we hit another break-even point over here. With non-linear cost curves, it is possible to have multiple break-even points as we do over here. Here is the second scenario, profit maximization approach two. This is where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. To understand this, let's look at the numbers given here. Again, we produce widgets and we sell widgets. The price of each widget is 100. So this looks like a perfectly competitive market. So pure competition over here. When we produce one, the price is one, total revenue is 100. Let's say that the cost of producing the first unit is 150. So the total cost is 150. The profit here is 50. And the marginal revenue is 100. The marginal cost is 50. What we are saying over here is that the fixed cost actually is 100. Since at a quantity of zero, the cost is 100. When we produce the first item, the total cost is 150, which means that the marginal cost is 50. We produce the first item, the additional cost is 50, the additional revenue is 100. It makes sense to keep going. With the second item, again, the additional revenue is 100. The additional cost of producing that second item going from 150 to 175 is 25. Again, marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, so it makes sense to produce. With the third item, the marginal revenue is still 100. In fact, the marginal revenue is always 100. Since the marginal revenue is greater than the marginal cost of 50, we keep going. With item 4, again, we keep going because marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost. With the next item, again, marginal revenue greater than marginal cost. So we keep going. But then we stop. Why? Because here with item number 6, when we 
sell or if we were to sell item 6 we would get 100 but the cost or the marginal cost the incremental cost of producing item 6 is 150 it does not make sense to spend 150 to create item 6 and then sell it for 100 so we stop over here the logical amount to produce would be 5 and if you look at the profit the profit is maximized at a quantity of 5 if we keep producing after that then the profit will start coming down graphically we have something like this a dollar figure on the y-axis quantity on the x-axis a marginal revenue is flat that is 100 notice that for quantity of 1 2 3 4 the marginal revenue the incremental revenue is more than the marginal cost so it makes sense to keep going up till this point where the marginal revenue is more than the marginal cost after that we should stop because when we produce the sixth item the marginal cost exceeds the marginal revenue so simplistically we say that profit is maximized when marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost this is an extremely important condition and i think the chances of being tested on this are very high so make sure you know this well this condition applies across all types of markets whether you have a monopoly or perfect competition or monopolistic competition these are terms that you will study in detail in the next reading but no matter what the market structure this condition holds this is the condition for profit maximization also in a earlier slide i told you that the quantity produced is the quantity where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost there you took my word for it now you know why it is the case what i want you to do now is do example 7 from the curriculum which deals with profit maximization economies of scale and diseconomies of scale on this slide we will talk about several concepts first let's distinguish between the short run and the long run in the short run at least one factor of production is fixed in the long run all factors of production are variable simplistically let's say that we consider two factors of production labor and capital economists generally use the symbol k for capital if we say that in the short run labor is variable but capital is fixed then we will have a certain short run cost curve we might for example have a short run average total cost curve that looks like this so short run average total cost so this is one short run average total cost say this is based on having one factory where labor can vary now it is possible that in the long run we set up two factories and when we set up two factories then with two factories then our short run average total cost curve is over here overall by having two factories we might have some efficiency because of which the overall average total cost is coming down as we see over here and then if we create a third factory then it is possible that we have a short run average total cost curve that is over here notice the following we can create this long run average total cost curve from the short run average total cost curves so the long run average total cost curve is actually derived from the various short run average total cost curves that's an important point which is made over here over this segment of the long run average total cost curve we have what's called economies of scale where as we increase quantity or increase our output the average 
total cost is coming down. This point over here is called the minimum efficient scale. What that means is that if our quantity produced is in this region, our long run average total cost is the minimum. So this is the efficient point and we can also say that our optimal output is over here. If we start producing beyond that and our average total cost, specifically the long run average total cost starts going up, then we say that we have diseconomies of scale. It is possible that when a company becomes too big and it becomes difficult to manage, then the average total cost might actually go up. And some say that a company like General Motors experienced this situation where it became so big and inefficient that the average total cost went up. What I have shown here is one type of an average total cost curve or one type of a long run average total cost curve, which is U-shaped. As the curriculum describes in Exhibit 28, we might also have a downward sloping long run average total cost curve. We can also have a curve that looks like this. So there can be different shapes for the long run average total cost curve. Now I want you to read example 8 which illustrates the points that we have discussed over here. On this slide, we'll talk about profit maximization in the short run and long run. For simplicity, let's assume perfect competition. Let's say that we are a company and we have this sort of a long run average total cost curve. In the short run, we have one particular factory. And for us in the short run, this is a short run average total cost. The price in the market is P1. So this also is a marginal revenue curve and a demand curve. Let's say that this is a marginal cost curve. So the optimal quantity for us in the short run is Q1. And since this is also a short run average total cost curve and the marginal revenue, which is also the same as average revenue is equal to the short run average total cost, our economic profit is zero. But we realize that by expanding, let's say opening another factory, we can actually shift along our long run average total cost curve to this efficient point. So when we open up a new factory, then this is our new short run average total cost curve. And let's say that we now have this marginal cost curve. If the price continues to be P1, then we are in very good shape because that's the revenue. So that's our average revenue per item sold. This is our average cost, our average total cost. And we make a substantial amount of economic profit. But what will happen in the long run is that other companies will enter this particular business. So there will be more firms. Remember, this is perfect competition. So the barriers to entry are probably low. Other companies will enter. The supply will go up and the price will start coming down. Chances are that the price will eventually come down to this point and the economic profit will be wiped out in the long run. This is something that we will study in more detail in a later reading. Over here, we will look at different kinds of long run supply curves. So simplistically, we are looking at three pictures here. In all three pictures, quantity is shown on the X axis. This is the total output. And we have a dollar figure on the Y axis. Clearly, if these are supply curves, then here we are looking at uh, increasing cost industry where as we produce more, the cost goes up. Here we are looking at a decreasing cost industry and here we are looking at a constant cost industry. Examples of these different types of industries are given over here. 
Let's look at the increasing cost industry in a little more detail. Let's say that initially we have a demand curve D0 and a short run supply curve S0. And say there is an increase in demand. So the demand increases from D0 to D1. What is going to happen is we'll move from this point E1 to E2. And the prices over here at E2 are obviously much higher. There will be economic profits. And because of the economic profits, other firms will come in. The supply curve will shift to the right. And eventually, we will end up at this point over here, E3. And since this is an increasing cost industry, the overall prices will increase from this point over here to this point. You can use a similar analysis here for a decreasing cost industry. And here you will notice that eventually the prices will keep coming down. And in a constant cost industry, the prices will stay the same as more competitors enter the industry. Now I want you to read example 9 from the curriculum. Section 3.2 deals with productivity. Let's understand a few terms first. The total product refers to the total output from all inputs during a period of time. You will see the symbols TP for total product or Q and these are used interchangeably. Productivity is the average output per unit of input. Typically it is stated as output per worker or output per unit of labor. Obviously, we can also have productivity measured as output per capital or output per some other factor of production. But mostly in economics textbooks, we look at output per worker. This is the easiest to measure. Average product. This is the total product divided by the quantity of a given input. So this is a measure of productivity. Total product divided by the number of workers used at that output level. And this will be TP divided by L or Q, which is quantity of output divided by L. Marginal product. This is the amount of additional output resulting from using one more unit of input, assuming other inputs are fixed. And again, we generally change labor. So we say one more unit of labor produces a certain amount of additional output. That would be the marginal product of labor. The formula would be change in total product divided by change in labor. And if you look at some simple numbers here, this column is the number of units of labor. If you have one unit of labor and the output is 100 widgets, the average product is 100 over 1. Marginal product obviously is 100. Total product, let's say that you then have two units of labor. The total product is 210. So clearly two people working together are doing a good job because the output more than doubled. The average product has also gone up. It's 210 divided by 2. And the marginal product is 110. This is 210 minus 100. The rest of the numbers are derived the same way and should make sense. What you can now do is example 10, which covers these concepts, but the numbers are a little more complicated. Concept is the same though. Here we look at marginal returns and productivity. Increasing marginal productivity and law of diminishing returns. What does this mean? If you take a subset of the numbers we saw on the previous slide, notice that when we add the second unit of labor, we have increasing marginal productivity. With the first unit of labor, our marginal product was 100. With the second unit of labor, our marginal product went up. This is called increasing marginal productivity. But as we keep adding more labor, so here 
as we add the third unit, then the marginal product actually comes down to 90. Adding the fourth unit of labor causes the marginal product to go down even more. So what we are observing here is something called the law of diminishing returns, where we say that as we keep increasing a factor of production, initially there might be efficiency, but at some point we will have inefficiency in the sense that the marginal product is coming down. And I also illustrated this in a picture that I drew earlier. If we have labor on the x-axis and total product on the y-axis, what is happening is initially the total product is going up at an increasing rate. But as we keep adding labor, total product goes up but at a lower rate. This is where we have diminishing returns. Now let's look at the relationship of average product and marginal product. So this relationship relative to average variable cost and marginal cost in the short run. If you recall from section 3.1, there we talked about this relationship where you have quantity of output on the x-axis and a cost or dollar figure on the y-axis we said that the marginal cost intersects the average variable cost at the minimum. Over here we are talking about average product and marginal product. Let's say we are talking about the average product and marginal product with respect to the quantity of labor. This is the factor of production that we are concerned with. And on the y-axis we are looking either at the marginal product or the average product. The point to note is that a marginal product, which is the output per unit of labor, is maximum, and that's a good thing, when the marginal cost is minimum. So these two points correspond to each other. Also, the point where average variable cost is minimum, so that's this point over here, this corresponds to the point where the average product is the maximum. So you need to recognize these facts. In this region over here, region 1, we have the average product and the marginal product going up. And notice that the marginal cost and the average variable cost are going down. So output going up, costs going down, which makes sense. In this region too, we have marginal product going down and marginal cost going up. Also, we have the average product going up and the average variable cost going down. And finally, in this region, we have average product and marginal product going down and marginal cost and average variable cost going up. So you can look at this and based on the pictures that you are seeing, try to remember the relationships. Now let's look at the marginal product and price of input. Firms will maximize output per monetary unit of input cost. So if your input is labor, what a firm will want to do is maximize the this particular ratio which is the marginal product for labor divided by the price of one unit of labor. Now think about this. Assuming two factors or two inputs, one is labor, one is capital, and you are running this particular firm, what factor would you use if the marginal product so this is your output per price of labor. Ultimately, what matters is the money that you are paying. So if your output per price of labor is two and your output per dollar spent on capital is four, then is it more efficient to use labor or is it more efficient to use capital? Obviously here, since this ratio is higher, it will make more sense to use 
capital because for every dollar spent on capital your marginal product or the additional output is 4 so you will use capital here is a relationship that you need to remember the least cost optimization formula is where the ratios all these ratios the marginal product of labor divided by the price of labor is equal to marginal product of capital divided by price of capital where these are equal the way you can think of this is if you have this situation what will you do you will keep using more capital and given the law of diminishing returns ultimately you will get to a point where this ratio is equal to the ratio for labor and the optimal point or the least cost optimization scenario is where the two ratios are the same now i want you to do example 11 this might sound a little bit complicated but when you look at the questions in the curriculum they are fairly simple and intuitive now we come to profit maximization approach 3 which we alluded to earlier this is where the marginal revenue product is equal to the price of a factor and let's understand this I have introduced this term marginal revenue product for the first time and hopefully you can guess what this means the marginal revenue product is equal to the marginal product of an input so this is the marginal product of a given factor multiplied by the price of the product this is the price of what you are producing and selling it shows the change in total revenue for one more unit of input so if we are considering labor as our input it is saying what is the additional revenue from having one more unit of labor another way of putting this is to say that marginal revenue product is equal to the change in total revenue divided by the change in quantity of resource employed so if this denominator is one that is saying that we have one more resource or one more unit of labor and if the change in total revenue is five then that means that the marginal revenue product is 5. So let's consider a very simple scenario. Our one factor now, let's say, is labor. What is the price of labor? The price of labor is the wage rate. Now, when you hire your first unit of labor, the wage that you pay is 5. If the marginal revenue product, the additional revenue you get by having this laborer number one, so the marginal revenue product is greater than the wage, it makes sense to keep going. What about with the second unit of labor? If you pay or the cost is five, but the additional revenue is six, then again you keep going. But if you hire the third laborer, here the wage is still five, but the additional revenue is four so this is where you stop and this should sound a lot like the earlier discussion we had where we said that the profit maximization point is where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost this is another way of looking at the same thing here we are looking at at a productivity perspective and we are saying that the profit is maximized when the marginal revenue product for labor is equal to the price of labor which is the wage rate if we consider two factors of production for example if we consider both labor and capital then profit is maximized when the marginal revenue product of labor divided by the price of labor is equal to the marginal revenue product of capital divided by the price of one unit of capital now to understand this well i want you to do example 12 from the curriculum again this might sound a little confusing but once you do the question it is fairly intuitive that brings us to the end of this reading i will summarize the main points you need to understand the concept of profit 
and the fact that there are different definitions of profit. Accounting profit is simply the total revenue as measured based on accounting rules minus the accounting cost. Again, this would be the cost based on accounting rules such as IFRS. Economic profit is the total revenue minus total economic costs. The key point with economic costs is that it includes accounting costs and implicit or opportunity costs. Normal profit is the profit or the accounting profit that must be earned in order to meet all the implicit slash opportunity costs which are not accounted for over here. And economic rent can be thought of as follows. If you have price and quantity and you have a inelastic supply curve, there is a particular demand curve over here and this is your price. If the demand increases now, then the additional amount paid for the product, which is this rectangle, that is the economic rent. It is the total income or the total expenditure above the opportunity cost. Then we talked about total average and marginal revenue. Total revenue is fairly straightforward. Average revenue would be total revenue divided by the quantity sold. Marginal revenue is the revenue for one additional unit sold. Break-even point is the point where the total cost is equal to total revenue. We can also say it is the point where the average cost is equal to the average revenue. Shutdown point is the point at which a firm will shut down. In other words, if the price that a firm gets is less than the average variable cost, then a firm will shut down. The short term supply curve is that part of the marginal cost curve that is above the average variable cost. There are three different approaches to determining profit maximization output. The first and simple approach is to say that we want to find the quantity such that the difference between total revenue and total cost is maximized. The second approach is to say that we want the quantity at which marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. And the third approach, which is a productivity based approach, is to say that we want marginal revenue product to be equal to the cost of the factor of production. If we say that the factor of production is labor and the cost of one unit of labor is denoted by W, then profit maximization happens where the marginal revenue product, which is the additional revenue from one more unit of labor is equal to the cost of that additional unit of labor, which is denoted by W. We talked about economies of scale, and this had to do with the long run average total cost curve. If you have quantity over here and a dollar figure on the y axis, as we increase quantity, if the average total cost is coming down, then we say we have economies of scale. This is the optimal point or the efficient point, And after this, we have diseconomies of scale. Short run and long run profit maximization. With short run profit maximization, what we are looking at is the short run average total cost curve. And we are saying that we have a marginal cost curve which intersects at the minimum. The profit is maximized where the marginal cost curve intersects the marginal revenue curve. In the long run, we want to maximize profits by being at the efficient point. Decreasing, increasing and constant cost industries. Here we talked about the supply curves in the long run. In a decreasing cost industry, as the industry produces more, then the costs come down. In an increasing cost industry, as the quantity produced increases, the costs go up. 
this would happen in industries such as the oil and gas industry and then you might have a constant cost industry where the average cost stays the same regardless of the quantity produced. Total marginal and average product of labor. This is simply referring to the output from a factor of production. The typical factor of production that we use is labor, although we could use other factors of production such as capital. So total product of labor would be the total output when we use labor. Marginal product of labor would be the additional output from using one more unit of labor and average product of labor would be the total output divided by units of labor. Marginal revenue product which I talked about earlier is the additional revenue that we get when we use one more unit of a factor of production such as labor. Diminishing marginal returns this refers to the fact that as we use more of a factor of production, initially we might have efficiency, but we get to a point where the output increases, but at a decreasing rate. When that happens, we say that we have diminishing marginal returns. And then profit maximizing utilization level of input, we talked about that over here. So that is it. As always, go over the summary in the curriculum, review the learning objectives, do the examples in the reading, do the practice problems, and also do practice problems from other sources. That is it.